Welcome, and thank you for joining today's State, Local, Tribal, and Private Sector Policy Advisory Committee meeting, also known as the SLTPS PAC. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming SLTPS PAC meetings, please subscribe to the Information Security Oversight Office's overview blog at isu-overview.blogs.archives.gov or by going to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials have been emailed to all registrants. While this is primarily an audio conference, you're welcome to join WebEx with the link provided with your registration. If you have connected through WebEx, please ensure you've opened the participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. Please note all audio connections are currently muted with the exception of SLTPS PAC members, speakers, and ISU. If you are not a member of the SLTPS PAC and would like to ask a question or make a comment, please hit pound two to raise your hand. If your audio is through WebEx today, you may click the hand icon at the bottom of your screen or send your question to all panelists through chat. Another option is to email your questions and comments to sltps underscore PAC at nara.gov and someone will answer your questions there. For our SLTPS PAC members, please mute all audio connections when you're not speaking. This is a public meeting. Like previous SLTPS PAC meetings, this will be recorded. This recording, along with the transcript and minutes, will be available within 90 days at archives.gov slash ISU slash oversight hyphen groups slash SLTPS hyphen PAC slash committee. Let me now turn things over to Mr. Bill Fisher, the Acting Director of ISU, as well as the Acting Chairman of the SLTPS PAC. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 28th meeting of the SLTPS PAC. I'm Bill Fisher, the Acting Director of ISU. I'm the Director of the National Declassification Center at the National Archives in my permanent position. At this time, I do not have any news to share about when a permanent Director of ISU will be coming on board. I will now turn it over to my designated federal official, official Heather Harris Pagan. Thank you, sir. I'll now begin attendance. We already know that Mr. Fisher is on the call. SLTPS PAC Vice Chairman Richard McComb? Yes, Heather, I'm here. Thank you, sir. Department of Energy member Natasha Sumter? DOE's alternate Tracy Kindle? DOE's other alternate Jamie Gordon? Good morning, yes, Heather. Here. This is Thompson. I'm sorry, who was that? Natasha, Natasha? just joining. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, is and Jamie Gordon? This is Jamie. Thank you. Nuclear Regulatory Thanks. Commission member, Tara Inversa? I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Department of Transportation member, Sidoni Dunham? I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Department of Defense member, Michael Russo. Good morning, Heather, present. Thank you, sir. Office of the Director of National Intelligence member, Lisa Perez. Good morning, I'm present. Thank you. Central Intelligence Agency member, John. I'm here, thanks. Thank you. CIA's alternate, Abby. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Federal Bureau of Investigations member, Jacob Zucker. FBI's alternate, Scott Gerlach. Department of State member, Katherine Connor. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. State's alternate, Darrell Hicks. Department of Justice member, Glenn Bensley. Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency member, Derek Broussard. DCSA's alternate, Scott Cronin. Uh, present, thank you. Thank you, sir. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency member, Nitin Natarajan. Vice Chair, Cameron Burke. I'm here, Heather, thanks. 
Thank you, sir. Private sector member, Jeffrey Insall. State Mountain Region member, Kevin Klein. I'm here, thank you. Thank you, sir. State Mountain Region member, Chris Palmer. Present. Thank you, sir. Speaker, Kevin Dillon. Present. Thank you, sir. We request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency, if applicable, before speaking each time for the record. I want to remind government membership of the requirement to annually file a financial disclosure report with the National Archives and Records Administration Office of General Counsel. The same form of financial disclosure that is used throughout the federal government, OGE Form 450, satisfies the reporting requirements. If you have any questions, let us know. We have had a few changes to the PAC membership since the last meeting. The alternate designated federal officer, Robert Singali, has retired. Daryl Parsons with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has also retired. His replacement has not yet been designated in writing. Additionally, Cameron Burks was voted the vice chair among the FLCPS entities we have. We still have eight out of 12 slots that are open for membership among the SLTPS entities. If you have any nominations, please bring them to our attention. For those departed members, thank you all for the contributions over the years. We look forward to continuing the work you have done with the new representatives. The minutes from the last meeting were finalized and posted to the ICU website on September 29, 2013. I'm sorry, 2023. I will now address the items of interest from the February 21, 2024 SLTPS PAC public meeting. After a complete review by DHS, it was identified that DHS's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, INA, had an accrual of cases awaiting the personal clearance uh, process in, in support of their mission, which is intelligence sharing capabilities with state and local partners. The original INA SLTPS backlog was 215. They are now down to less than 100. Additionally, Lee, Forge, Lee Watson from the Forge Institute posed questions regarding ODNI's role in facilitating high, -end, high side discussions and collaboration in the field. Lisa Perez from ODNI engaged with Lee, promising to engage with the appropriate ODNI office for further investigation into the standardization practices. After engaging with the appropriate ODNI office, Lisa reached out to Lee for further details. Lee expressed intent to further engage when in the area next. No specific dates are planned at this time and it will remain open. Does anyone have any questions? Candace, is there anyone in the queue with questions? Not at this time, but as a reminder, you can press pound two on your phone. Uh, to raise your hand, and if your audio is only through WebEx, you can click the hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. There's no one in queue at this time. Thank you. At this time, we would now like to hear from the executive agent for the program, the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. McCall? Uh, good morning, uh, Heather and everyone. Uh, just a couple of comments from me before I turn it over to Mr. Juan Estrada to give uh, everyone here an update on uh, the uh, ongoings here in DHS with regard to our SLTPS program. But uh, I would like to echo uh, uh, Heather's comments regarding uh, membership uh, from our SLTP partners. Uh, please uh, do let Heather know or uh, myself or Mr. Estrada. Uh, we are uh, certainly interested in uh, filling the, uh, the vacancies that we currently have on, on the, the, uh, the pack here. So, Please let us know that, and uh, we'll we'll be happy to accommodate and let you know how to how that process works and walk you through that. Uh, also, would like to uh, offer my con congratulations and thanks to Mr. Burks uh, in his new role as the uh, SLTPS Vice Chair. So, welcome aboard, Cameron. Thank you. And then I would like to add, uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, uh, working with uh, the intelligence analysis partners here, over here in, uh, in uh, DHS uh, and with our headquarters support staff, we're able to actually now have that backlog down to around 20 on uh, the pending clearances for action, so uh, making good progress there. Uh, with that, 
Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Juan Estrada to walk uh, through some details for the uh, pack here today. Juan? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> good, good morning, everybody. Again, this is Juan Estrada, DHSO CSO. Uh, I'm the branch chief of the SLTPS Management and Oversight Branch uh, with the Compliance Standard and Training Division. As we do it at most of these SLTPS PAC meetings, we provide the, the group with a couple of details on, on statistics as far as clearances and inspections that um, that our office uh, completes each each year. So as of now, DHS has approximately 7,800 SLTPS personnel with DHS sponsored security clearances. 90% uh, of this population have a secret clearance, and the remaining 10% have top secret clearances. Um, I, one major initiative that DHS is working on is standardizing the nomination form that is used for this community. Uh, DHS is filing a new SLTPS preliminary nomination form for clearance eligibility. The goal is to have one standard form across uh, the community to include the components. Uh, what we identified when we peeled back the onions as far as um, clearance nomination goes is we recognize that uh, all the components to include internal DHS was using multiple types of nomination forms. So uh, our office took the initiative to kind of come up with one form. Uh, we're piloting that right now. Uh, so some of the states are going to see that coming across uh, their desk within the next couple of weeks. And again, the goal is to the goal is to uh, push out that form at the beginning of uh, fiscal year 25. Uh, from, a, from a compliance and governance program perspective, uh, DHS has performed two new room certifications. So we have two new fusion centers, uh, secure rooms, and we have completed 15 facility uh, secure room inspections uh, that fall under DHS purview. The, the, the schedule right now calls for 18 to be completed for fiscal year uh, 24, so we're only three away from completing those uh, that requirement. Uh, so whenever a, an individual or whenever a state requires a new room certification, they usually go through INA and request that that room be certified by DHS. Uh, so INA will go out there, conduct their preliminary inspections, and then we'll go out there and certify the room. So we had two new room certifications this year. We're currently working on the inspection schedules for FY25. Uh, we'll be pushing those inspection schedules out to the directors and the security liaisons at the beginning of the uh, of the new fiscal year in October. Uh, and then last but not least, DHS initiated an administrative clearance review of its sponsored SLTPS clearance holders as an ongoing initiative to protect classified national security information. Um, I think last pack we uh, we announced that we were going to roll everybody into an automated e-learning management system for INA clearance holders. Uh, that rollout was very successful. And so when we plan on rolling out this year, we did 100% validation of clearance holders uh, that are supporting the INA mission. And what we identified is over 750 personnel who no longer require DHS clearances. Uh, so through the work of INA, uh, OPS, OPSC, in our office, well, we were able to um, to administratively or debrief individuals that no longer needed a clearance. Uh, we're going to continue to roll out that initiative next fiscal year, and anytime we do an inspection, uh, we'll be running those those reports through our ISMIS reporting system to ensure that we are identifying anybody who no longer needs a clearance. So th those are the high-level uh, initiatives that we're working on with DHS, so CSO. Uh, any questions for me? Thank you, I'm but, sorry. Uh, Kevin Klein, I, I had a question about uh, for the for your, uh, state and local partners, uh, as far as uh, people that are falling off the list, um, are you going back to the security officer at the, those organizations and asking them? I, I, I heard that we had to wait, so I didn't know if, if it's easier for us to just let you know who's dropped off. Yeah, um, anytime somebody drops off, please please let us know. I, I think there is an initiative right now with PSC to go back to you guys to feel to ask, but um, if, if you guys have that information ahead of time, send it over to us and we'll we'll take care of it. But yeah, uh, one of the one of the challenges was is that uh, we couldn't get the list of who's got 
clearances that you know that came through us. So we'll might want to work on that too. I got you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll I'll um catch up with you afterwards to, to make sure we can support you. Thanks. All right, Heather. I think that's it for us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Greatly appreciate that. Candace, do we have anyone in the queue for questions for DHS? There are no hands raised at this time. Thank you, ma'am. At this time, we will now introduce our speaker, Mr. Kevin Dillon, Associate Director of Strategic Relations with the Stakeholder Engagement Division at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, will brief on what his office can provide SLTPS entities. Kevin? Hey, thanks, Heather. Appreciate the introduction and uh, great to be here today. Uh, as Heather said, name is Kevin Dillon with CISA's Stakeholder Engagement Division. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of uh, CISA's operational priorities, some of our initiatives, and then services that are available to everyone on the call here. Um, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA for short, uh, we're the newest federal agency in the uh, newest agency in the federal government, excuse me, uh, established in 2018 to be America's Cyber Defense Agency. Uh, we lead the national effort to understand, manage, and reduce risk to our cyber and physical infrastructure. Um, CISA has a, we have a strategic plan laying out four goals really to, you know, address a lot of the challenges facing the United States. Uh, we have three goals fo focusing on how the agency will work to reduce risk and build resilience. And then a fourth goal really focusing internally on uh, the CISA agency itself. Um, our first goal is around cyber defense and really leading the national effort to ensure the defense and resilience of cyberspace. Um, as I mentioned, serving as America's Cyber Defense Agency, we lead the national effort to defend against cyber threat actors that target uh, U.S. critical infrastructure, federal, state, and local governments, private sector, and the American people. Um, we really, you know, we're leaning forward on the cyber defense mission, um, all, you know, towards a collaborative, proactive risk reduction measures, work with many partners, um, you know, part of our responsibilities help mitigating the most significant cyber risks to the country's national critical functions, both as, the, as these emerge and before um, incidents occurs. Um, our second strategic goal is risk reduction and resilience. Um, it's all about reducing risks and strengthening the re resilience of America's critical infrastructure. Um, we coordinate national effort to secure and protect against these critical infrastructure risks. And this is all around centered, centered around identifying which systems and assets are truly critical to the nation, you know, understanding why they're vulnerable, why they may be vulnerable, and then taking action to manage and reduce risks to them. Um, CISA serves as a key partner to critical infrastructure owners and operators nationwide to help reduce their risks and build security capacity to withstand new threats and disruption. Um, third goal is around operational collaboration. And really trying to strengthen whole of nation operational collaboration and information sharing. You know, at the heart of CISA's mission is really about partnership and collaboration, uh, working to secure cyber and physical infrastructure. Um, you know, always challenging ways of doing business and actively working with our government partners, industry, academic, international, um, really to be action oriented collaboration. You know, really committed to growing and strengthening our agency's regional presence, which I'll talk about and uh, delivering capabilities and services to our stakeholders that need them. Our fourth goal is more internally focused, agency unification is what it called, really just driving kind of a one CISA approach through integrated capabilities in our workforce, um, really just all about creating that one team uh, behind our shared mission, just being the most efficient um, agency that we can be. Um, so shifting over to just some of the um, services and capabilities, I'm gonna mention um, our CISA regional, um, presence. Uh, CISA has 10 CISA regions, same aligned to the same thing as like FEMA's, and really they're all about directly supporting uh, local government, critical infrastructure owners, operators with uh, risk mitigation solutions, capabilities, services, etc. An example of some of the things that they can uh, provide for you, cyber and physical vulnerability assessments, things like architecture review and design, subject matter expertise, incident response support, exercise planning and support, um, they do uh, help around national special security events. Um, each region has a regional director and then has, depending on the size of the region, may have multiple uh, protective security advisors, cybersecurity advisors, emergency communications coordinators, um, chemical security experts, 
um, election security. So each each region has um, a cadre of those staff um, that you know can conduct you know in person, et cetera, um, conversations and meetings to sort of chart a path for you and talk about CISA services and capabilities. Um, the regional staff, again across the country, support all 56 states and territories, um, and again really help there to help you with capabilities through a wide range of initiatives. Um, uh, another campaign we have going on, I'll talk about a couple campaigns and then finish up with services. Um, you all may be familiar with CISA's Secure by Design uh, campaign. We launched that in 2023. And this is all about um, urging software manufacturers to really revamp how they design and develop um, products, software, to create a future where uh, technology products are safe for customers out of the box. Um, in 2024, we really were moving from awareness into industry action, um, and turning those principles into progress by creating a Secure by Design Alert series, uh, where we publish blogs and starting to reframe the conversation to focus more on the, on the software manufacturers and um, what they can do to uh, really implement that Secure by Design. Um, CISA has a Secure by Design pledge. We have a, you know, a little bit over 150 um, technology companies that have signed on to that pledge and it has a number of actions for them. Um, and we'll be, you know, checking in with them and looking for them to publicly state how they're implementing the, the actions there. Um, really trying to get folks to kind of move away from words like vulnerability when discussing cyber incidents and start using more terms like product defect, coding error, to really make it clear that software manufacturers, um, you know, can do more around fixing these defects to prevent cyber incidents. Um, we really think kind of reframing this conversation is really important because um, th these manufacturers can start to uh, implement safer software and, uh, you know, really, really understand the, the mechanisms to do so. So, you know, as we continue to push the Secure by Design message, um, this uh, had a Secure by Design white paper a year ago, initially came out with 10 U.S. and international partners. And then um, roughly six months later, we had seven additional partners joined us to publish an updated version of that. Um, titled The Balance of Cybersecurity Risk Principles and Approaches for S uh, Secure by Design Software. Um, to learn more all about this initiative, um, cisa.gov slash secure by design. You can see all of the um, papers that we publish, the blogs, alerts, et cetera. So it's a good resource there on uh, cisa.gov. Um, another campaign I want to highlight is our Secure Our World, our Evergreen Cybersecurity Awareness Campaign. Uh, we launched that in September of 2023 and launched a public service announcement, really kind of, you know, fun, fun way of doing it, really just all about bringing awareness to the public, um, about being safe online, really focused on four key messages. Um, then we had a second PSA we launched in May of this year, 2024. Um, each PSA focuses on four uh, key messages, um, recognizing and reporting phishing, using strong passwords and a password manager, uh, leveraging multi-factor authentication wherever, whenever is possible, and then um, updating software and leveraging automatic updates whenever, wherever possible. So that, that campaign, um, again, will continue. That's our umbrella cybersecurity awareness campaign. Um, as we start to look towards October and cybersecurity awareness month, uh, we'll have some additional videos really honing in on each of those four behaviors I mentioned. Um, all be in a similar style and sort of, you know, kind of same characters, just to kind of bring that brand recognition forward. Um, same thing on CISA.gov slash Secure Our World. You can find a number of resources that are available. You can use them as is. Uh, we have tip sheets for each of the four behaviors. Those are translated into a number of different languages. So, you know, if you wanted to have your own sort of campaign or, you know, um, create some of your own social media, you can, you can leverage the materials that we have. We've got toolkits up on there. Um, we'll be doing a lot of uh, social media around October Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We do post uh, on, on CISA social media every Tuesday, something framed around Secure Our World. So we're very active in that, in that space. Uh, you may have even maybe heard it on the radio or TV, things like that. We've got some ad buys going on for, for that piece. Um, so I'll jump over to CISA services, um, you know, services and, and tools that are available to you now. Um, again, many of the you can find all the details on CISA.gov, but we, CISA offers, frankly, you know, a number of no-cost resources and tools, um, which I'll, you know, talk about a highlight, a few of those, uh, things like cyber hygiene vulnerability scanning. We've got our cybersecurity performance goals. But really, we kind of always suggest folks start with the um, 
kind of top three ser services that we offer, really kind of foundational um, actions to really help you start building a program if, if you know, you're kind of just starting. First one we say is really, you know, connecting with your regional cybersecurity advisor that I talked about. Um, again, these folks assigned to all of our 10 regional offices. Uh, regions are depending on the, the states that you go into. So again, cisa.gov forward slash regions. You can find all of the, the breakdown, see which region you would fit in, and then the contact information for any of those folks. But then, you know, second piece, we'd always say, you know, signing up for that cyber hygiene vulnerability scanning service. Um, even if you have a robust uh, vulnerability management program in place already, um, this can complement that. It is, you know, uh, it could be, it's, you know, no cost to you, easy to sign up, and it's going to be scanning your externally facing uh, addresses on a weekly basis, which you'll get a report. Um, you know, so we really, you know, encouraging, we're trying to get a, a greater uptake of that service. It scales widely, right? Meaning, you know, if the, the entire audience here signs up, you know, there's there's plenty of room for that. Um, and the capability that can be be done real easy. If you um, sysa.gov, you find that service, it's a simple email to request it, and they'll get you set up and running within about two weeks at most. Um, so very easy to sign up for. Another area we have is um, our cybersecurity performance goals. Um, we have a an assessment around this and a checklist, but these are really a common set of practices that you know all organizations should be looking to implement and kickstart their cybersecurity efforts. So this is you know. Up from small and medium-sized businesses up to large organizations, um, helps prioritize investment uh, for uh, you know essential actions that have high impact outcomes. Um, we've even mapped these um, services to a link we have called Free Cybersecurity Tools and Services, so that if, um, if there's a capability we have linked to, some some of those are CISA services, some of you know external partners that have provide free capabilities. We link to those things. You can say, you know, if you don't have a capability in there, there's many times there's a link to a um, free tool or service that either CISA or, or one of the partners that we have is um, captured there. Um, there's things like uh, CISA exercises. We can do things like tabletop exercises, can send sort of pre-canned materials around those. You could do, you know, on your own or have, um, you know, bring in CISA ex exercise subject matter expertise to facilitate things. So there's a couple of different ways to manage that. Um, the final one I would mention, we also have our uh, cybersecurity evaluation tool, CSET is the acronym, and this is a, you know, standalone desktop application, really all about guiding owners and operators through a process of evaluating their either operational technology environments or their IT environments. Um, we have a newer module in there called a ransomware readiness assessment, um, just essentially a self-assessment um, based on a set of recommended practices just to, you know, understand how how well you are to equip to defend against or recover from a ransomware incident. So good, good capability there. And then, you know, on CISA.gov, uh, last one I mentioned is you can sign up for alerts and advisories. So we're sending out, um, you know, industrial control system alerts, vulnerability summaries, um, you know, product alerts, things like that. It's a pretty active um, alert system. You know, you likely get, you know, two to three emails a week. Um, so kind of in closing, you know, as a final resource, would always direct you to that CISA.gov website. Um, the, the the website is really organized by service and tool tools. Um, you know, really makes it easy to find. You know, basically a one-stop shop to help you find all the resources that you need. Um, you know, so we always suggest, suggest uh, take a look around there. Um, you know, look at the resources, look at the regional capabilities that we have. Um, you know, all that information is there and stays really active and updated um, on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, really appreciate you all having me on here t on the call today. Happy to um, stay around and take any questions, but um, thanks for the time. Back to you, Heather. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions for Kevin? Candace, how about the queue? How's that looking? We do not have any questions um, because someone raising their hands. Someone, some question did get posted in chat. I'm going to send that to you now. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we have a question that says AI large language models, LLMs, may present a significant challenge to the classification system due to their ability to infer sensitive information beyond the classification level of their training data. 
To tackle this issue, a collaborative team, including scientists from a national laboratory, Yosha Bengio, and researchers from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, UIUC, is conducting red team experiments. These efforts provide crucial insights for policymakers and could play a vital role in developing robust safeguards for classified information. We're looking for your expertise to sh help shape our research direction. Would any stakeholders be interested in advising on potential experiments and helping define the scope of this project? If so, please reach out to me. My email is heather, H-E-A-T-H-E-R, dot Harris Pagan, H-A-R-R-I-S-P-A-G-A-N, at N-A-R-A dot gov. Thank you, Candice. Are there any other questions? There's no one in queue. All right, thank you. We are now at the point of the meeting where we ask for SLTPS members to present any new business they may have. Does anyone have anything? Do any members of the public have any questions or remarks before we close out today's meeting? Just as a reminder, you can press pound two on your phone or click the hand icon on WebEx. All right. Well, um, our next SLTPS class is scheduled for January 8th, 2025. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>